many of those things don't necessarily can't relate together. So I think they're very, they're very, they're, they're in tension with one another. Um, I also think, sort of, uh, if, in terms of, in terms of politically, the, the the idea that we have some sense of genius when, particularly, when you walk into a building like this, you know, um, I think it sets up a whole, a whole, a whole systematic. Um, form of barriers to to achieving what you want to achieve. In other words, we kind of go along and go, oh, I'm not a genius, I can't do this. You know? And actually, I think it, it, it's actually the opposite. We can we we haven't got something named gene genius genius gene. In fact, there's it, it, it's it's something else that, that we kind of use that term to almost uh, uh, come away from 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 what we're actually describing. So it um, so. The decisive moment is a point in time when all formal compositional elements of the picture come together. That's what Bresson, uh, Cartier-Bresson asserted. And he wrote that the photographer, and I quote here, composes a picture in, in very nearly the same amount of time it takes to click the shutter at the speed of a reflex action. And Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment offered a new way of seeing and capturing events of the world around us. So just to grab a kind of historical <laughs> You know, photography uh, was kind of evolving and is evolving, but certainly um, when prior to Bresson, we're probably photography was a much more slow, elaborate process. So Bresson was one of the one of the, the first people to kind of make, make these things a much more rapid, um, fast uh, uh, activating event. So my inversion of the word decisive to indecisive is not necessarily to invoke a sense of indecision or hesitancy. But it's instead, I use it to suggest uncertainty as to when a specific instant may occur, and most importantly, to highlight that, it, um, that there is something that happens before and after any single moment. So, Roland Barthes suggested that a photograph presents an illogical conjunction of the here and the formerly. So in this sense, former past is presented here to us on the surface of a photograph. Essentially, what we're saying, or what he was saying, is that we have a picture that shows us something that happened in the past, and it is there in the present. So the here and now of time, the here and now time of a photograph is, of course, any time, including future time, and a time when the future image will again be looked at. So time, which is embedded into photography, um, is not only the time of the past when we took the picture, but also the time when we may look at it in the future. And I'll come back to this, this, this issue around time as it applies to the work that I produce. So media theorist Lev Manovich has suggested that over the surface of the screen, digital in, in his sense, um, time is spatialized. In other words, we experience time through the screen itself. And by this he's suggesting that we may experience modernly represented time, so what we mean by that is the way that we have usually experienced time as a narrative, as a homogenous event. So even when it is expressed as spread out and distributed. So that's going to sound a little, little bit complicated, so I'll try and explain it. But um, in movies, in cinematic form, time is invariably represented as a component of narrative structure. So if you think about something like, uh, well, go to TV, like 24 of the TV series, or time was kind of embedded in that whole narrative. And um, the way that we perceive time is actually, and I suggest that the way we perceive time is actually different. It's actually only informed by the mediated way that time is given to us. You're going to have to bear with me with these kind of slightly enriched philosophical <laughs> things, but I, I hopefully it will come clear in the way that I produce the work. So, um, so time is invariably represented as a component of narrative structure in the same way that dialogue or plot are devices used to tell a story. So philosopher uh, uh, John, um, Deleuze conceptualised within cinema what he called the time image. So that's an image which breaks from classical Hollywood understanding of time. And Deleuze's specific understanding of time emerges through Henri Bergson's account of clock time, in which moments are broken up into discrete instances. And here we come back to photography. Because he says, or they, they kind of uh, propose, this idea that, that we experience time as like the ticking of the clock, the successive decisive moments of photographs that tick. Click. 
But for Bergson, and subsequently for Deleuze, who drew on Bergson, time is not understood like that at all. Uh, it's not seen as discrete, contained instances. And what he says is that time flows, and such as the present is penetrated by both the past and the future, in the sensation of memories about the past, and desire relating to the potential future. So we may experience something of time's elasticity when the day feels as though it's running slowly, like during this lecture, you're probably sitting there thinking, wow, he's gone on for in ages. That is the sense in which time is not those kind of discrete broken moments. Um, so when we're bored, or perhaps when, when, when time passes really fast, um, then we, we, we have a different experience of the moment of time. And yet we're kind of formed, our perception of time is, is organised in a different way. So Bergson suggested that reality is characterised by different experiences of time that take place in the mind. So time should not therefore be understood as a fixed, stable phenomena, but a personal, variable, exactly experience. And images, more specifically, in keeping with the emphasis of my talk, photographs, are ways of slicing through time. So with the development of photography in the 19th and 20th century, perception of the world became dominated by instant and privileged views. I've got a quote here from Bergson, who summarises the photographic instant. So, he says, instead of attaching ourselves to the inner becoming of things, we place ourselves outside of them in order to recompose their becoming artificially. Um, I won't carry on with the rest of that, but I'll, I'll leave it up there to, uh, for you to read. So, um, photography allows us the moments that define some characteristics of perception, and appreciating the moment, such as arrivals or departures or moments to remember, is taken for being perception itself. So Damien Sutton uh, wrote about time, that time and space are understood only through reflexive experience. So uh, to appreciate the now in which we live. Now, Bergson suggested that reality is constructed <coughs> and goes on through the invisible realm of durée. Um, however, our minds fragment this experience in order to make it feel more manageable. So in other words, we can't really experience, in experience this kind of um, uh, elasticated time. We kind of want to contain it and, uh, and lock it down into singular moments. And since we cannot ever cease the flow of durée, then we attempt to arrest it by breaking it down into moments and order. And our perception is therefore at odds with how Bergson suggested that reality is. So I propose that today, I'm going to show you some work now, as we cut or slice through time with our photographic images, we not only create photographic moments in which time is interrupted and experienced in a fragmentary way, but also to the multiple instances of photographic mediums, we're not only situated with media, but also in media. So this is um, a piece of work that I did uh, with um, a researcher down at Falmouth, and she's a performance artist. And what, what I've actually produced here yeah, came out of a, a, a set of kind of um, issues that, that, that the project itself brought about. So she asked me to go and video her enacting her performance. So what she does, and this is her in the kind of the red and the black there, is she essentially lays out a large sheet of white paper, puts some charcoal down, and then swirls around on it, sort of moves her body around and creates these, these circles. And I videoed, I, 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 she asked me to go and video the work, to document the work, which I did. And um, <coughs> when, when I showed her the video, she decided that she felt too vulnerable in the video. She felt like the, and I will show you a small clip of the video, but she has asked that it's not something I can put on the web or that, that I kind of share widely, widely. So because of that, because of that sort of like having, and, and here we come back to the, like, the pra pragmatism of producing work, and you'll all get there. So I turned up with all my cameras, all my lights, got the studio, we spent the whole day doing it. I produced what I think is a really, powerful video and then the client says, no, I don't want you to use that. And I'm like, what? You know, what can I do with that work? So what I then did was I took the video and I took a frame every 
I think it's every minute, or it may have been every five, every three minutes of the video. And I took an image from Premiere, so I just essentially went through, shot for the frame, I took an image, created mo multiple images, and then created a single piece of work. So obviously this, this is sort of a much larger piece. So this is all the multiple instances, the frames, and if I could just you know, remind you where, we, where you nodded off through the Bergs and the Deleuze stuff. The, this is the most, multiple instances of time represented on, on a single sheet. Now, I actually then went on to develop some further things. So, um, that's to remind me to put the video on. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is I'll just show you, <laughs> I will quickly show you the video that I produced um, with Katrina. So, not only performing as in performing for an audience, but <laughs> doing the performing of it, or the drawing as a performance. And, um, the, the still image. But, but there was still something more that I wanted to find. So, what I did was um, I wanted to create something from. Um, from, from, from that music that's beyond, that kind of more represented the, the work that she produced. So, um, and also, I'd, because I've the video, I'd kind of, I'd, I'd created the music, and I'd done, it, I'd done everything on that, so it's like a, a big investment in that piece. So, I then took the, I was quite interested by the sound of the charcoal, and the kind of the noise that she made, she kind of moved around the paper. So, I took the, um, the soundtrack, of her moving around the paper, and I, I programmed a, a, a small uh, piece of uh, a computer programming to create a circle based on response to the audio. And what I did is I just, I basically, I created this program, and what it does is it creates a random circle with a random color based on the sound that comes <laughs> from the audio of the video. Now I've. Every time you run the program, it creates a different piece, and then what I do is I export all the circles, so I have a nice big thing in a circle based thing. But I'll just show you when I'm talking through the kind. Of, so this is just a video of it rather than the actual piece. So um, again, I start the music as well. So, uh, so this, yeah. So what you get is the soundtrack of her moving, and then I took all the color palette from the images that I had there. So you can see the reds of her top and the black and the white. And each of these, every time it moves, every time there's a sound, it's kind of created, it's not responding to the music, it's only creating the, um, the track from her movement around the page. And so every time there's like a, a larger um, noise, you'll get like a, 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 a spike in the, uh, in the in the circle. And eventually what I did was I kept running this program and created these multiple circles which were all different. And then I put them all together as one big thing. My other response to that, when the project goes bad, you have to find another way to make the project good. So I went, I, again, I won't run this through, but I'll, I'll, I'll just... In the end, it starts to look or something like that. It gets to this really massive um, as it goes up. So, as I say, that was kind of a response to a situation and also a response to the kind of work that I was looking at in terms of time and in terms of uh, the way that photography, imaging, um, creates can kind of respond to diff different experiences. Okay, so um, let, me, let me just. Uh, so fundamentally, I wish to argue that photography is becoming less momentary or instantaneous, and that is not to suggest that we're not taking those quick, grab, spontaneous images. We are, and we know, and we're taking lots of them. But what I'm suggesting is that our indecisive moments usually result in a prolonging of realization about our sense of time an elongation of the temporal. So we may take more images not because these are all decided upon at the moment we take them. We take more images precisely because we are indecisive, because there is always another moment to fragment and to break down. And it's this extending of the temporal register connected to photography that I believe contributes to a different understanding of photography and to perception itself. 
So perception has, with the age of a networked image, become more closely connected to this being with and in, or precisely being within media. So the shift from the decisive moment towards an expanded and anticipated moment of post-productive create uh, post-productivity has created a new photographic event. And I suggest that such a modification of our concept of photography focuses our attention away from any clearly false sense of photographic truth uh, toward the deliberate creation of what we might term future memories. And these are closely linked to the network image. So what I'm saying here is that we can't often go out with our mobile phones and take pictures in a kind of anticipatory way of what those pictures are going to do. We know that we're going to upload them to Instagram or put them on Facebook, and we kind of deliberately produce a kind of false sense of image. So I should qualify a term here. My use of post-production, while for many of you it probably refers to software processes such as the use of Photoshop or Lightroom, um, and I don't, I don't discount that, but I also consider that the transformative process in which a digital photograph becomes part of a network is also post-production. Therefore, uploading, tagging, sharing, liking are significant parts of my understanding of post-production. I should now attempt to outline something more of what we see of some of the instances of photography, and within these, um, sketches of photography, I hope that a bit more of my work will become, become kind of understandable. So in this first instance of photography, I argue that we are, or at least as visual scholars we should be, increasingly aware that photographs we take are little more than tribute balance to other images. So whenever we take a photograph, all we're doing is perfecting the skills of photographic karaoke. We kind of know the words and we know the tune, we're just kind of reproducing the same stuff. So a simple Google image search reveals the extent to which photographic image, image ideas are far from unique and original. They exist long before we even have them. And in fact, may be useful, it may be useful to remind ourselves that the ideas for our images, their social and cultural benefits, <coughs> pre-exist any visual conception. So these ideas are in essence projected onto the world. And we see, and we occasionally create or make images translated from these ideas. So we may think that we're out there kind of finding images, and that there's some artistic genius that we're realizing. But in fact, uh, we're just following the instructions of pre-created or pre-ordained images. So Paul Frosch suggests that the images, that images are now produced on an industrial scale. And their future use is often speculative. Their form is usually bland and repetitive and designed to be overlooked. But they form what he describes as the wallpaper of visual culture. And Frosch's analysis is largely centered around stock imagery. Um, but he's more recently looked at another culturally significant form of the selfie. Um, and he says that, well, he, he talks about the replete, repeated duplication of visual tropes that dominate digital photographic production. And I, I was trying to understand what we might think about that and, I, I, and what that might, might kind of mean for, for, our, for, for my work and for, for, for us. So if we return to that question of perception and how it's formed, uh, Bergson and Deleuze suggest that all life is image. In other words, that we are living in the image. Then, if we start to think about the fact that all our images are just visual tropes, that would suggest that we're just living this kind of formula template. We're just kind of going on repeating what everyone else has done, which is you know, maybe may a little bit worrying. So we have every right to be alarmed at the homogenization of image as life. And we should therefore, as image makers, be drawing attention to or presenting a critique of the general trend to produce so many interchangeable images. And furthermore, we should examine what these specific representations actually say about photography, about representation, and about ourselves. So in terms of the selfie, for example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, such images are less about indexicality, pointing to something, about the impression of reality on the surface of the image, and they're more cl closely connected to an action enacted by the photographer themselves. So pho photographs like the selfie have become somewhat conversational, used in applications like Instagram, WhatsApp, <coughs> etc. They state something of the proximities of being both here and there within the culture of mobility. 
As Frosch has pointed out, the selfie goes beyond the complex, uh, it goes beyond that complex to declare something which is, and I quote, which is not just see this here now, but also see me showing you me. So building on Frosch, I see the instances of oft-repeated uh, images as gestures towards mediation, the articulation of language from within, and also language, but, well, language within, but proposing to be on the outside. So the challenge of working on the outside of an overwhelming volume of images was my most significant problem when I started working on my PhD, because I didn't want to just produce more images. So having had a career as a set as a photographer, I'd already taken a lot of images, and the idea of just doing some more images seemed slightly, slightly irrelevant. So I therefore concluded that in order to be relevant to my theories, I, I didn't want to just add to the pile. So instead I decided to try and understand what images other people took, and how that's how I developed a method of participatory photography, which you saw the people at the beginning. Uh, they were part of the people that I worked on the project. <coughs> So, uh, with, so for uh, what I was looking at is why others take photographs, and I'd attempt to question what for and why. So in parallel to this was my search for how to photograph what had already been photographed differently. So in other words, trying to find a different attempt. And because I was looking at the landscape, so I was actually looking at the uh, China clay area in Cornwall, um, I, I was aware that landscape photography is a, is a genre that is predominantly about surface, landscape surfaces, and to a certain extent it's, it's predominantly about superficiality. So I was committed not to reproducing those kind of romantic, aesthetic, ideal images of familiar landscapes. So it's a question to me to, to understand how can I represent the landscape without explicitly picturing the landscape. So I went to the uh, <coughs> Clay Museum and I started to work on uh, the items that they had in the archive. And this is a piece of work that I started out with just the single images, and then I again came back to this idea of the multiple framed work and the, the, the group structure. Um, and what this is, this is a mine captain's journal, his diary. And it basically, if I mean, this is, a, again, a large print where you can read the, the text here, but it kind of says things like, wet and rainy today, you know, mine production down by 20%, whatever, whatever. Um, you know. And it goes through here, and there's various things, and it's sort of, oh, you know, nice sunny day, went out for a meal with, with the wife, stuff like that. And this is, this is around uh, 1908, 19, yeah, no, probably about 1914, I think this is right. Um, but what, what I found really interesting when I was photographing this, and this is that kind of responding to work, as a, or responding to the object, is that in the back of the book, he'd actually, so if the book's like that, and he'd written his journal, he'd, he'd actually turned the book over, started again, and written down the names of the people that were absent <coughs> from work, which is the title of my piece, Absent from Work. So, he'd, so this journal was not only a kind of a, a dialogue with the landscape and with the environment, but it was also a little bit of a, a kind of a cataloging of the people and, and also perhaps a sort of quite restrictive uh, document in terms of what, what was going to happen to these people. And there was one guy who got hit by one of the, one of the trucks that came down from the, the, um, the sky team. And it said, you know, that this person was kind of absent from work for, for three weeks and we don't know whether he's coming back. So I was kind of fascinated by the, the duality of that document. And I, this was the work. Uh, I created this and I was kind of quite happy with it, but I always felt there needed to be something else. And because I work a lot across media, so working with video as well, and working with participatory work, I decided to kind of extend this project uh, last year into something a little bit grander. So um, I, what I did was I got, I, I got some, um, because this was a, a journalised diary. I got, so this is my concept for the work. So the work doesn't exist in this form. I'm quite interested in the idea of what, how do you map out work even when you haven't got a handout of the space. So what you see here is the components of the entire piece. So you have a large print on this side. Uh, you have a, a, an enlarged part of the text that you can read here. And then the, the gallery space will be divided. And on this side, is a text which explains, but doesn't explicitly explain, it just kind of sets a context for the elements. 
And then here, I got some of my participants to read out the journal of their day. And I'll just play you a very short clip of that. So you imagine, um, what I was trying to set up here is that if you came to see this work, you would kind of see the still image, which is the journal of 1914, whenever it was, of the mine captain. But then you would hear this contemporary account of life um, in the 21st century. Every Tuesday, I volunteer at the local primary school and listen to four and five year old boys and girls read. I'm also making short parts the next day's work were ordered. 5 a.m. Heard Spencer and Dean go to work, went back to sleep. <coughs> Saturday. Wake up, darling clockish. And after a page, she became pensive. And I asked what the matter was. Tuesday, went out to Daddy. This is assuming that none of the technicians are found in sick or late at this point. Feeling better, got up for work, good start to the day. Noticed the lights weren't working on the garden in the lounge. Rain. Horrid. 10.15am, a colleague comes to ask whether the flashy new MFD will do anything as simple as playing vertical view. And I asked how mummy was. Oh, she's fine, because she doesn't work, just stays home and makes cakes and things. Uh, woke up, went downstairs, turned into the kitchen, waited for Poppy to wake up, to impress her with my daily medications. 12 o'clock, Cheska and I went to Mum for coffee. Francesca stayed to help Mum decorate her tree. I collected all my dirties and throw them down the stairs. Pack some hoodies the boys had had grown into a bag to give to my nephew. Put the washing to dry, put another load on. Daddy is very tired because he works very hard. Got the blink of an eye, it's 5.30 and I find myself catching up until... Dramatic facial expressions accompany every word. Of course it does, but it's so complicated it requires two members of staff to work out how to do it. Clearly. Hopped on my bike with a bag of hoodies and then fell off. It's a good idea, yeah, yeah. Much laughter and very special people. 10 a.m. Woke up late because I didn't go to bed until half past two. <coughs> Turning off anything left on in the old shop. I go out to the shops. So I spend the next. Okay, so the idea is that you kind of, the way that we experience things is kind of in a, in a multimedia way. So I was trying to kind of bring two things, two forms together and express something of the landscape in that place, but also express something of the experience and day to day experience and kind of get those, those things kind of working together. It also came out of a, a whole set of work, which I won't talk about here today, but about this idea that we don't experience anything in isolation. So we experience these kind of um, the sense in which the world is kind of like going on, so all the time when we're having conversations with each other, we're actually sitting there thinking about the, you know, what I've got to do tonight, or oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't finished my module assignment, I haven't been down the park recently, I haven't seen my friend, I haven't texted my dad. All those things are going on at the same time. I was trying to, all my work somehow addresses some of those ideas, the complexity in which we don't just sit there and passively absorb one thing, even when we're in the cinema, you know, still sitting there thinking, did I, did I buy a parking ticket for the car? I don't know. So, anyway, right, let me, uh, let me continue. So my second instant of photography, post-photography, or photography after photography, suggests a sense of how photographs are made after the conditions of taking a photograph in the conventional sense that they are created. So this may simply be in the review process on the back of the digital camera screen or on a mobile phone. <coughs> or it may be a more complex engagement with post-production cast using computer-based software. The photograph is reviewed. Um, the photograph as reviewed is only decided upon after the decisive moment has passed. And this may not be seen as dramatically different from uh, Cartier-Bresson's selection from a contact sheet. However, I argue that the reassurance any instant review process gives undermines the sense of there being any perceived decisive moment. So there are merely many moments and which we can later decide upon. So the disconnection from what we might term as conventional or analog photographic time to real time viewing changes the emphasis of photography such that the camera mutates from an apparatus of recording to a device for playback. So beyond the review of images on the recording device, we're now presented with a choice of how what we have taken will be materialised. 
And in the past, the chemical process of negative to print or film to slideshow was predetermined. While there was opportunities to manipulate, modify, or improve our photographs, um, it's usually, uh, it was most usually a procedure reserved for professionals. Even then, beyond the print stage, there were few options uh, for the destination of photographs. The photograph, photograph album was probably, is probably the most obvious one, but clearly the gallery and other spaces also. So today, we have an expanded post-production process, one which, more read, one which is more read, readily accessible to anyone with a reasonable home computer, or even a mobile device. So clearly, the destination of photographs may be the internet, or our TV screens, or, as I stated earlier, in the form of utterances across mobile application conversations. So critical in this second instance is the hybrid nature of the digital image. It can be used multiple times, and it can be incorporated in, into other mediums, such as video or with other images. And this allows us to create images which work for us. So in this sense, we begin to create images with a view to knowing, or at least hoping, what responses they may achieve. This comes back to our Instagram wanting to get likes, or wanting to get comments, or um, people looking or sharing our images on Facebook or social media. So photography is, in a sense, an agent, or as Gomez Cross and Maya have stated, it's a socio-technical network containing multiple agents that grow daily. And they go on to assert that the iPhone, or any, any smart media device, is significant since it enrolls different actors. So an actor is someone who kind of enforces or something that makes something happen. So professional or amateur photographers, media, software companies, social networks, general users, all those people are kind of involved and engaged in the same thing. So added to which, mobility and connectivity are the corners that, which are the cornerstones of mobile phones and their cameras become part of the language of photography. So my own engagement with post-photographic instance could be expressed um, in this work, which I have entitled Ritornello. And that means the little return in music. So it's where you would have a piece of music that would kind of go on and <coughs> come back and replay itself. And the idea was that every time you kind of hear a, a phrase or a piece, and when, once it's repeated, we kind of have a different relationship to it, a different response. So if you imagine the chorus of the song, when the first time you hear it, it's just part of the melody. Then when the chorus comes up again, it becomes remembered from that point, and it, it changes, it mutates into something else. So I started to apply that concept to photographs, and what I did was I took some photographs that I, um, that I had taken, and I tried to re apply them. So essentially they are the same image but just shifted slightly along. So this is that kind of that revisit of the same place. And again this is me trying to, uh, this, is, this is quite an early piece of work, but I was just trying to understand how I could possibly make the landscape different um, through photography or, or, or my experience of the landscape different. And I also remembered here, and this is when I come out of the psychoanalysis I think, I remember as a kid having these cards that had an infinite joining ability. I think they were dinosaurs, but essentially you could lay them out in any order and they would always link up. So I kind of, I, I kind of had that idea as well, that we were kind of creating this, this other landscape from a single image, and separating them out. And this is all done in post-production, so it's not, it's not, not no grand mystery behind how I did it here. But when I had presented this work, a lot of people thought I was presenting stereoscopic images. And that was another thing that kind of occurred to me when I, I used to have one of those Viewmaster things which had a little disc and you kind of went like that home up to the light. So this different 3D space. And I'll come back to that in, in a minute because I've, I've translated this work into some <coughs> video pieces. But um, essentially, yeah, this, this kind of work um, evolves around the idea of the, the relationship between the single image but actually the return at a different view. And I was just trying to kind of articulate the the multiple spaces um, of that landscape. So there's a whole series of images here. I, I, did, um, I did play with adding some text to these images as a kind of third way of expressing some of their ideas, but I was less comfortable with the outcome from that. So I've kind of returned back to these, these, um, these larger forms.
So this area, this is all the China play area which my research has been kind of exploring for the last four years. Okay, so on to the third instance. Um, yeah, okay, there's a quote. Yeah, and I was watching this the other day with my children. Uh, Casino Royale, uh, James Bond, and uh, M says, it's not what we do, it's what we're photographed doing that matters. And I kind of thought that was a really interesting point. We can kind of do anything. If people see us, it suddenly has a different, a different meaning, a different kind of response. Um, it also reminds me of that, uh, the, the, the story of the guy on the island, I may have told you this, I'm not sure I've told you the third years, but the guy on the island, uh, and he's, he's, um, he's stuck on the island with, uh, I don't know, uh, let's use some stereotypical attractive one. Yeah, but, yeah. He's stuck on the island with, with Kira Knightley. Uh, they're, they're, they're marooned on a desert island, and um, so this, this is a psychoanalytical story. So he, he's on this island with Kira Knightley, and uh, the, the, there's no chance of escape. So they decide that, um, that uh, having kind of sorted it out, they decide that they're, they're going, to, going to have sex together. So they, they go away and kind of like that. It's kind of like, in some ways, it embodies his whole kind of fantasy. So, so, so he has sex with then he says to her, she, well, she says to him, well, you know, how was that? And he's like, yeah, it was great. He said, but, you know, there, there is one more thing I'd like you to do. And uh, she says, well, what's that? He says, well, um, could you put a beard on and dress up as my friend? And she's, oh, okay, yeah, right. So, so she puts on a beard and you know, puts on a fashions a jacket and comes up to him as a friend and they pretend. And he says, you never guess what? I just had sex with Kira Knightley. <laughs> the point is that you have to share what you do for in order for it to have any meaning for it to have to kind of resonate. Anyway, so I, I don't mind just distracting myself with having sex with Kira Knightley, but maybe, maybe it's kind of on my mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the independent, uh, uh, on the 14th of May, Terence uh, Blacker observed that it's the fascination of cruelty that is now so pervasive that we hardly notice it's there. So he believes there's a di direct line from the uh, Abu Ghraib prison uh, in Iraq to the millions of home computers across the Western world. Pictures not all dissimilar to the shocking I images from Abu Ghraib are, are available as a form of home entertainment. And I'll just quote from here from his, uh, his, his article. So he says, um, if you tap the words torture, rape or slave into a search engine, you will not be led to human rights organisations or academic reports, but to thousands upon thousands of websites specialising in recreational sadism. All this is mind-bogglingly bogglingly profitable because it taps into that age's most compelling vices and weaknesses, cruelty, voyeurism and boredom. And the problem is consumers are never satisfied by what they're offered. So the third instance of photography, I argue, this is me now, back to the is photography as in fact. So the photograph is something that exceeds the normal image making that we recognise. However, I wish to extend that further by suggesting that it is because of the ubiquitous nature of photography that this excess of photography has become normalised. So somehow we kind of we experience it and we just think it's just okay to watch a kind of a highly productive produced video of ISIS people dropping someone's head. Um, and now, in the, the visual worlds we inhabit, it's difficult to discern whether what we're seeing is some sort of fantasy or some form of hyper-reality, a reality staged for, or to be in some way excessive. So it's as though the exterior, media-saturated world of images increasingly resembles our inner space of subjective fantasy turned inside out. In other words, the kinds of things we think about are suddenly actually already out there. Rather scary. So, D.W. Winnicott was uh, some suggesting that the transitional object was something that represented the passage of children into a differentiated world, to a world in which they become aware that they're separated from the body of their mother. So, Winnicott also noted that the location of cultural experience could be found like the transitional object in what he describes as the intermediate zone somewhere between a shared external reality and a personal inner psychical reality. So the intermediate zone is the place where photographic images operate, and it might be argued that they too act as transitional objects, easing us into 
of persuading us about a differentiated world that is outside of us, and yet occupying a space that's situated both externally and internally. So perception then is impregnated with reality, fantasy, and memory. I'm just going to play you another video here. Um, this is my attempt at um, Google, uh, Google Street View. So what I did was I attached a, a GoPro camera to my car. <laughs> to the roof <laughs> of the car. <laughs> and then I drove very slowly, much to the annoyance of the, <laughs> the, the local <laughs> residents. And this is again is the trying to play area. So again, I am sort of, sort of knowingly referencing some of these things uh, that we experience. <laughs> So, um, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll talk just over this while, while it's playing just so we can move on. So, uh, yeah, so essentially, um, what, I'm, what you're hearing there, so I'm here, and it sounds a little like So, this landscape is known locally as the Cornish Alps. And what you're hearing the sound of is me travelling down in a ski lift in the French Alps. Uh, this is the sound of the lift as it goes over the, the, the kind of the, 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 the pilots that hold it. Uh, and, but you're, what you're seeing is me driving along in my car doing a kind of Google, Google Street View thing uh, with, with some text uh, from um, uh, Jean Luc Godard's um, uh, film, which is, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it will come back to me. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I've actually bought a ski lift so I have a ski lift at home which is really part of my final PhD project and it's containing all this sort of slightly uh, kind of work. So, uh, but this, and this sound is actually from one of the lifts that I bought. So I bought this kind of pod shaped thing, I think some of you have seen it. Um, and this is, this is me sitting in it two years ago in France with my mobile off the phone kind of trying to, just recording the sound of us coming down in there. So just, uh, uh, just playing with the ideas of, um, if we come back to that thing of the, the fantasy image, what I'm trying to do is construct an image from multiple experiences. That, that thing that I was doing with absolute work, I'm trying to make you think about a different space. So here we have what's called the Cornish Arch in a nothing like French Alps, of course. And probably most of the people in Cornwall haven't even been, well, most of the people in that area have been in uh, uh, And they're my sort of trying to wrap Backstory. I do at times find myself quite bewildered by the sense in which, at that time during the 80s, I didn't examine some of the uncertainties that I had about some of the things I was being taught. In other words, people, I, although I was, I kind of embraced the whole kind of theoretical thing, I was also sort of slightly unsure that I kind of really understood it, or that I really thought it was kind of fulfilling some of the, the experiences that I had with, with images. And actually, I should um, re-examine that process because some of the things that I was being taught um, in the strictly uh, post-structural, post-modernist sense through a Freudian psychoanalytical framework were very much challenging the order of um, the, sorry, loads of French words here, Swissarian model of structural linguistics and the construction of the signifier and the signifier. So what I'm trying to say there is that I was taught sort of a fair amount of stuff around um, a kind of binary order of imaging, um, and also the, the, the sense in which, uh, yeah, I guess the way that we understand images, or the way that we might interpret it, images, in that post-structural way, which, if, if you're not kind of familiar with it, it's, it's probably too complex to kind of really sum up in a word, but essentially it is that idea that this was one way of thinking about photography during the 60s, 70s and 80s, 
And actually, that, that has sort of been superseded a bit now, but even at the time, they were kind of setting out the stall for superseding itself, if you see what I mean. So, it's some, it, it is with some relief, and also with a degree of anxiousness in my own mind, that, that I've come now to understand and embrace like, some new ideas associated with what we might term non-representational theories. So, in other words, theories that the photograph isn't a representational surface of something, but it actually has uh, other properties that significantly affect. So, in other words, we respond to it not just as an image, but actually as a, as a kind of form of encounter. So when we look at a picture of, of someone we love, it's not just that we're kind of um, uh, trying to understand it in the sense of its form or its content, but actually we're having some sort of repression <coughs> response to it, and we're like, it's triggering a whole set of memories and things like that. And it then changes who we are and how we're orientated towards it. So, um, Foucault, French philosopher, wrote that the relation of language to painting is an infinite one. Words are not imperfect, he said, they are inadequate. And so it is, a, it is in vain that we attempt to express what we see or that we try to show what we are saying through images and metaphors. Rather, what it is that we see can never reside in what we say. The difficulty in explaining what it was like, you know, when you go home tonight, what was that? Well, I can't really explain it, you know, that, that, kind of, that kind of response. So, um, a term, the figural, is best described as a way in which we simultaneously, we speak and we see. And both are con contained as a strata in which one deforms or transforms the other. And it's a way of describing both the visible and expressible. So this is going to get a bit tricky now, so we're just going to have to bear with me for just a few more paragraphs. So discursive space is segmented into the segments of visible and expressible. So like layers in the earth, what we say and what we see, each are interlinked and uh, define each other uh, through periods of time. So back to Deleuze, um, he suggested that there are three fundamental ways to organise archaeological space in order to examine the relations within it and across it. So um, what he's trying to do is understand how, how structure actually is structured, if you like. So he says that our, our archaeological space, um, and I'm applying this back into kind of discourse and culture, yeah, uh, is organised in terms of the correlative, the complementary and the collateral. So co correlative space defines the terms of association between what can be said and what can be seen. And what I mean by that is, um, again, drawing on Foucault, he enlightens that sort of analysis through a piece of work that he did called The Birth of the Clinic. And he expresses the association between, uh, and I quote here, the relation of situation and attitude to what is speaking and what is spoken about. What the hell does that mean, you might say? Right, okay, so for Foucault, he says that diseases have their own alphabet. They have their own language and they have their own organisation. So when you go into a hospital, you are spoken to and your body starts to embody that of a patient. And he was saying that this is a, a way in which society kind of structures how we work. When you guys come in here, you are come in as students and you are spoken to as students, not as the cleaner or not as Andrew, the, the head of the college. You, you get spoken to in a particular way and your life gets organised in a particular way through the discourse of the institution. And so, with the space of medicalization, Foucault argued, the body changes what it is and how it is seen and examined and interpreted. It requires instruments, technologies and language to document and classify it. Okay, so that's the correlative space. Complementary space is the relation between discursive and non-discursive. So again, an example of that is something called the Panopticon prison, which is a prison where prisoners live, and they live in a big circle, and in the middle is a tower, and they never know when they're being watched, but they assume they're being watched all the time. So it's a bit like speed cameras. We kind of never know when they're on, so we just slow down just in case. So it's that idea that, that society has a, a, a way of controlling us without actually anyone being there controlling us. Um, and then collateral relations are where other discourses make a discourse possible. So in other words, they provide a context 
for and, and make context um, happen. So in this sense, there are no isolated basic units, and this is back to that semiotic thing that you have a unit and something else that the signifier represents one thing and not another. Um, in, if we go back to the linguistic model that I was trying to explain there, it's a bit like when I say cat, you immediately know that I don't mean dog or mat or whatever, whatever. So linguistics works on a kind of binary opposite. These days, theory suggests that we've kind of moved away from that, that we're much more in a kind of hybrid space. So in this sense, um, there are no isolated or basic units. Instead, we're confronted by a family of relations. And this ecology of systems is illustrated in a dense way by how things aren't just as they are. Things are created, formed, and interdependent. So representational practice, looking, is not a passive thing. There can never be the response that we were simply looking. Nothing is simple about it. So at the beginning of modernity, geometry and mathematical principles were the dominant forms of visual representational practice. The regime of optical spatial geometry is central to representational space. And I'm going to ask you about something like leading lines as photography students being one of those things that is geometrically orientated. So we kind of walk towards that. Um, so my final works are trying to suggest something about non-representational accounts of how we see and of the organising practices and relations that spatialise and format our seeing. They also, and I, I put seeing here, but they format our behaviours. So it's an acknowledgement of the controlling force of um, the database, the colour-coded spreadsheet, and uh, the insistency on structure to represent and uh, to represent and for representation to be organised through such a structure and the relation of random forces. In other words, we respond to timetables, we respond to uh, databases, we respond to emails, in, and they are the things that order the way we function through life. So it's also in the virtual world of cameraless image making or reforming of the image from other images that I've come to be interested. Now I know some of you have seen this, but this is my work I did over the summer. So this is a, 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 basically a web page. Um, what it does is um, I, I wrote the program so that it will take, this is just still shot, you can log on and, and find it, but I, I know I have gone through this with, with many of you. So essentially, these are the Instagram photographs tagged with China clay. These are the color palettes of all those Instagram photographs. These are the comments and tags of all the um, Instagram photographs that are over there. This is a Flickr search with a random word from somewhere in that common comments and tags. These are the titles of the Flickr images, and this is a Google search with a, from a random word within the Flickr image. Um, <coughs> so this is me starting to think about images are not just a representation of my grandmother sitting on the sofa or something. You know, images are actually experienced more in this way than in that way. They are experienced in the other way, but th this is something that I'm kind of more intrigued about, and how we function and work with the image, and how the image functions with us, and what it makes us do. And this kind of makes me go out and keep constantly tagging my Instagram images with China Clay just to see one pop up there. So I'm suddenly being controlled by the software. Um, so another. Another part of that, and this is probably going to be my last video, and this kind of relates back into uh, the work that I did with the Ritonello project. So what I did was I took a landscape, and I'd also been working a lot with 3D uh, software, so I, and I was really interested in parallax imaging. So the, you know when you kind of watch a TV program and everything stops and then the camera kind of zooms around and you see no trace of the camera, that kind of thing. Um, so I was trying to set up um, a 3D sort of parallax image of a panorama. And a panorama is another thing that I've been examining, but I won't talk about panoramas here, uh, other than to say that this is what this is suggesting. So, um, what I did was I tried to map these onto 3D models, but it, was, it started to go nowhere. So in the end, what I created was a set of uh, layers. So if we imagine this is my Photoshop file. I, I took my panorama image and I broke everything down from the mountain in the background to the trees in the foreground to this piece in that background, 
up in there. And I created these multiple layers. And then I imported them into Premiere and created a parallaxing uh, moving image. And you'll see what it creates is multiple um, panoramas as it moves through. So it's just a, uh, a, a two minute video, but hopefully you'll kind of get the sense in which it kind of <coughs> evolves. So you'll see that different parts of it start to move in different ways. And what I did was I, I took the same video and reversed it out so you're actually getting a, a kind of spread of the panel and the sky is moving slowly across behind the background. So you could never video that. You could never go to that space and make this video. And that kind of intrigued me about as a tale after the Um, so I'll just <clears throat> So the camera is no longer a part of what we understand to be photography, and perhaps even photographs are no longer a part of what we understand to be photography. The apparatus of photography is multiple and shifting, and the kinds of questions that we need to ask about this undecided object includes ones about how photographs gesture to us and how it's not us who bring meaning to photographs, but examining the ways in which we are brought into being by the field of representation. So we may ask, where are we when we look at photographs? Or perhaps, where will we be? Or where have we been when we look? So we may question why we need to show ourselves to ourselves, and how when we look at what we see, are we inevitably always in a state of uncertainty and undecisiveness? and how looking can be a dissatisfying experience. And I shall end now with a quote from Lacan, in which he states, I quote, When in love I solicit a look, what is profoundly unsatisfying and always missing is that you never look at me from the place from which I see you. Yeah, but which no, that's right. Yeah. 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 Y
sort of critique that about performance artists because I think sometimes you know is rewarding the performance very fair on a performance artist because maybe it's a bit like uh, stand up comedy or something where you're you know you're heckled and but that's maybe not your what yeah. you want recorded and they, they, sort of, they, they, they feel it they don't need to see it they yeah feel exactly, it, they don't exactly. Need to see it. so and, and in some ways maybe you know I was at fault for not being more sensitive to that maybe we shouldn't have more conversations about what was going to end up with the work. I mean, what, what was interesting, and I will tell another little anecdote about that, is that my friend Lucy, who, who knows both of us, um, she, she knew I was doing this work, and uh, she, said, uh, she said to me, oh, how did it go with Katrina? I said, well, yeah, you know, it went all right. I said, well, I spent the day doing this video stuff. And she said, uh, yeah, was she naked? Um, <laughs> yeah. I said, no, but yeah, she normally does this performance naked, but she obviously, to preserve my blushes and my innocence, uh, chooses to warm the clothes. Disappointingly, I'm sorry. How, how long does it take her to take a clothes off? Oh, no. <laughs> sorry. To make a picture, how long does she? Um, that, it's about 25 minutes, yeah. And she's actually, further on in the video, you get to see, I mean, I could share it, but it's probably, no. But you do get to see her all covered in charcoal, and it's quite, it's quite weird, it's, it is quite... She's got that first service bang on. Mm. Yeah, she's good at yeah, the yeah. Oh, we were just talking about... I should just go... Well, it's very good to see what you're saying, that you see the other side. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to express that you have to try and find work. You know, even when the work goes wrong, when it all goes badly up, you can still find a way to find... There's potential for drawing out work from work that doesn't work. If you face my view or well, okay, yeah, so I have a certain, I have a certain set of skills. But I don't think it's fine. You thought about sketching all your videos together, you started one real good boring video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know. David Lynch hasn't got anything on you. Okay, sorry, you got I, yeah, I have, and this is part of the problem. I have loads of video, I have loads of footage of my, those participants talking about photography, and I, I would have brought you with another one of those, but. Yeah, and I'm trying to work out what to do with it, and that's my point. I mean, you know, what do you do with all this medium? But it's always in flux. It's all that like, my project's there. You've seen those are things that I started a long time ago, and they've kind of evolved into different things. I have some from work one and started out as just a single piece, and now it's become a bigger piece, whether it ever materialised into something or not, you know, something substantive. I think some of that music would be fitting on that last video. Mm -hmm. I'm tempted to use my catchphrase, but I'm, I won't. <laughs> no, so the third years have kind of come up with a catchphrase for me. Yeah, right. yeah. No, it doesn't matter. Go on, just go on, babe. Did you think about it, bring the, the performance of this portrait forward to like using those three minutes? You said take a picture of every three minutes? Yeah. Those pictures to bring it further to like a sort of like flip book version of it? Uh, yeah, I thought about like, that because it does, it does do all that stuff. You know, it is the, and I used to love those kind of and, and so yeah, there's lots of kind of there's lots of playfulness that you could get out of that work, and I think really that's. <coughs> the way. I mean, today we I, I took the first years up to um, Ocean Studios and Tim Pierce is working with all the kind of old processes. But actually, what I'm saying is you can play with new processes in exactly the same way. You know, you've got a piece of video, you're know, reversing it, doing stuff backwards, playing around with things can make a different set of work. So yeah, there's all those kinds of opportunities to play with me and I think this is what will differentiate people going forward when we leave here. And people don't want the kind of straightforward approaches, they want some different ideas and you need to get your hands dirty and experiment with something. To take that final circle image from your hands, just bring it in. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what well, it's it's simple <laughs> down at the end of the day to the reach. Yeah, and but again you need you need some I think I didn't just randomly come up with those ideas, you know, it's, it's part, in part about the kind of reading that I do and the thinking and so also the, the not giving up, you know, not kind of looking at something and just thinking, oh God, I can't use it. It's actually sort of saying, how can I make that work? There's something there. Well, we've all had it, you know, you've got an image and you kind of think, there's something about that that's working, but I'm just not sure how to get it to the next stage. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you come in here and have a critique. But, you know, it's... <laughs> it is about sort of just saying, okay, where can I go with this? And I always think, certainly with digital stuff, anything's possible. So you just, you know, you just got to try and work out a way of doing it. How does she think to that um, digitization of the uh, She was kind of less interested because it's kind of not her thing. So she, she was, she was, she was yeah, you know, 
And I think she's a performance artist, so it kind of really is just very separate from her work. Uh, but she, yeah, I mean, I think she was just happy that it wasn't her couple of chocolate things. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't picture it. So we've got some. I think we've got another one. Any other thoughts? Yeah, why don't you put those skin bits? Did you break it? Sorry? He said you bought the skin bits. Yeah. Was that because you were trying to get the paint in the No. I thought you'd get a box for that. Yeah, I'm just saying. It can't find your brain in it. It does sound like it does. The skin bits is going to be part of the installation. So I was kind of interested in this whole thing of taking the out of the franchise to the corner shop. No, I I found it on the internet, but it did take me over a the year. Then I get hard to find. Not yet. I've listened to it. So I'm very close. I am using my two songs. Breaking out. I'm not at the moment because the grass is in my supervisor, so they need to read it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, do you have a restraining order? Yeah. How many times have you been there? Oh, too many. Too many weekends. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Okay, well, I'm really in the city. Thank you for coming, actually. I can't enjoy it. Me and Rhonda are thinking, how are we going to follow that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. With more yeah. entertainment than yeah. 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 uh, Maybe you're a Martina, I've got my entertainment. Uh,